let's go into the next part here, and I'll explain uh, why I think it's important to put the, the whatever happened in Bakhmut and then also tie it to the way that the U.S. is continuing to increase its aid. So the Wall Street Journal says, to aid Ukraine in a fight against Russia, allies are looking to a security model like Israel. Now, here's the problem, Ryan. I don't think a lot of people understand this. Before Ukraine, there was one country in the world that got more money from the United States than any other. Do you know mm -hmm. what it was called? Israel, and it was also a high-tech developed democracy. It was always a little bit curious why exactly they needed that money. Um, so they say NATO membership is not on the table for now. Oh, for now, why not forever? Um, and then US and European allies could create key guarantees for weapons and advanced technology. Now. The reason why I think that the F-16s are now flowing to Ukraine, that they are you know, engaging in these cross-border Volgorod attacks, um, and why they recently attacked Putin and all that is, look, on the one hand, things are going well for them. They killed a lot of Russians in Bakhmut. They obviously had massive success in their spring counteroffensive. On the other hand, uh, the Russians also killed a lot of them in Bakhmut. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The Russians are the ones with a population that can easily backfill mm -hmm. all of those dead people. They have an industrial base. They have an intact economy. Their homeland is not ultimately, you know, basically scorched. decimated yeah. or scorched earth. Whereas Ukraine has lost 20% or so of its entire territory. It doesn't have an industrial base, massive refugee crisis. They're drafting 55 year olds. I mean, things are not going well over there. I think even Zelensky would admit that, which is why he's constantly begging for ammo and for weapons. Well, one of the things that we're trying to do is basically pump as much into Ukraine as possible to make sure that they can maybe make some more gains in the spring offensive. From what I've read so far, spring offensive looks like it's still probably uh, coming. The issue for them right now is that the uh, ground remains still muddy. I was reading an excellent analysis yesterday about how muddy ground uh, actually can persist all the way up until June and that heavy rain is still forecast in the reaches. This could, we still right. could be waiting for a week, maybe two weeks, three weeks, something like that. They're really waiting for the conditions on the ground to get better. After that period, that's kind of the off switch for mm -hmm. USA to Ukraine, maybe. Um, so they're trying to pump as much into Ukraine as possible to kind of freeze the conflict where it is right now with Israel. But here's, you know, one of the dangers that I think that comes from that. You know, it's not like we didn't suffer the consequences for 60 odd years of our policy towards Israel in the Middle East that has caught not only about consternation there, it caused real issues for us. I mean, go back and read some of the original justification for why Osama bin Laden and all of them wanted to attack the United States uh, or Chechens, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's, the point I'm making is, it wasn't a costless decision, right. not only in terms of money, but also geopolitically. So are we signing up for basically a guarantee of Ukraine security um, forever? And if that's true, then you're basically, you know, giving them de facto NATO membership almost it at is, that right. point. Because Israel yeah. has sort of de facto NATO oh, membership in yeah. a way. Yeah, I mean, we basically have so many different interlocking yeah. guarant security gu guarantees. And then you wonder what you wonder who are the Palestinians in the Ukrainian question? Yeah, is, is, question. It, is it Russian speaking Ukrainians? Right. Who are then because before the invasion, the, the you know Ru Russian speakers in Ukraine were treated in a way that here in the United States we would find appalling. Mm -hmm. To say like if, if we ever see anybody saying like no Spanish, you can't yes. speak Spanish right. here, we're like get out of here. Like right. this is a melting pot. If they want to speak Spanish, they can speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. So you know attempts to ban the Russian language and things like that. So is that what they mean by? You know, it, it, or does that flow from that that model? If you actually put up this last element here, yeah, let's go to the next one, guys, please. Yeah, th this is like the vision that some war policymakers here in the United States have for, and have for how this war could end. And it's not crazy, like it's no. This it's, is actually this the is most actually violent. probably the most yeah. likely ending. They call it a freeze. So you, if you think about. Well, actually, Israel-Palestine, mm -hmm. a decent one. Or South Korea, that's really what they point so, to. South, right. South Korea, where uh, they basically have never signed a peace treaty, but Israel-Palestine too. There are just sort of lines that people recognize, not as legal lines that, that demarcate different countries, but lines over which we're not going to shoot at each other. Yeah. And, and, I mean, right. And that, so then that Russia keeps territory, 
but doesn't, quote unquote, keep territory. Yes, um, but there's a lot of perils to that. I mean, first of all, North Korea, you know, it didn't work out so well for us. We were like, ah, oh, we'll contain it, hermit kingdom, it'll collapse on itself. Well, turns out they actually not only survived, they also created nuclear weapons. And now they can bomb and destroy Los Angeles if they want to. And we have this basically madman, uh, not even mad, they're pretty rational, but they're also crazy. Um, and they have nukes yeah. and it's, 45 minutes away from Seoul, which is one of the most dynamic and incredible cities literally on planet Earth with massive amounts of GDP and companies, you know, making awesome cell phones uh, like maybe somebody <laughs> one just got. And, uh, th and those are all in danger. And also, people forget this. We have spent billion, hundreds of billions of dollars. We have bases all over South Korea. We have oh. uh, thousands of U.S. troops who are stationed on the peninsula at all times, specifically in case there's ever a jump off between North and South Korea. So once again, the, yeah, it's people, not costless right, people what has check, happened. But I think we've spent more in South Korea than anywhere else in the world. It might be, war after, it might be right. After World yeah. War II. And when you're at a state of perpetual war because mm -hmm. you've never declared peace, it also erodes whatever democratic institutions you have inside there. Mm -hmm. South Korea, uh, for that reason, was a series of military military yeah. dictatorships really? and coups. What, until the 1970s? Just, yeah, absolutely yeah. brutal, right. horrific place to live for right. anybody who was remotely critical of, of the government because they would use, well, look, these North Koreans are right mm -hmm. across the border. They're going to come marching into Seoul. So therefore, we need to crush dissent. You could see Ukraine developing that type of uh, uh, authoritarian culture yeah. if... They're constantly under threat because you because it makes sense. Like Abraham Lincoln was not the greatest Democrat at the height mm -hmm. of civil war. Well, let me fl flip it to uh, where I would actually say it was probably worth it in South Korea. And you know why? It's like I just said because they got cool companies like <laughs> Samsung and nice uh, a lot of us drive us a lot of us drive Korean cars. Uh, they have incredible technology. They are uh, great allies because they spend a ton of their money on defense. They're not moochers in any way. They uh, draft their, their their own men. Have mandatory military service. Like that's, this is that's not what Ukraine will do too. Ukraine right. will be one more place right. where we can dump all of our excess military capacity. Well, there's certainly that, but there's I, what I would posit is I don't see the next Samsung. No offense, coming out of Ukraine. Like I'm sorry. I I, in terms of I don't uh, know, like a, well, maybe they'll all get wiped out, but for yeah. 10, 15 years, I mean, wiped out by AI or whatever. Mm. But for 10 or 15 years, Ukrainian engineers and software developers yep. were the thing that were was powering. So you're right, tech. but a lot of them left. They don't right. live in Ukraine anymore. Yeah. Actually, so th those, from what I have read, are the very first people who actually left. Right. Um, they, they had connections they all, already. They here yeah. or they went to the West. They already had dual citizenship or any of that. So look, this again, it's not a slight. I'm just saying out of one of the most corrupt countries on earth, like I'm doubtful that we're going to see. And also, frankly, you know, at this point, like this is a down market region of Europe, which is already down market GDP relative to all of Asia. Sorry, Europeans. Um, I'm just, I mean, South Korea is massively yeah. corrupt. Too. Huh? So Matt, South Korea was massively corrupt too, that, uh, and just milking the I US. I think this as is a good well. point. So, uh, so I guess yeah. people can turn it around, uh, but I would just point at general trends and directions and just be like, well, which way am I betting my money on? I'm betting on Asia, um, and I'm looking at so what some what some of the things that are happening here and the Israeli and the South Korean model. I think uh, the two things that you and I can't agree on were they cost us a hell of a lot yes. of money in the long run, and not only that, we signed up for. Uh, security situations, which have definitely imperiled us. I mean, you know, and again, that can be worth it. I think it absolutely is worth it in the ter in terms of South Korea. But we should not. We should acknowledge that you know one of our major cities, Los Angeles or Hawaii, for example, one of our states, is literally at risk of annihilation because of our relationship with that country. I think that's a balance and a trade that is probably worth it in the long run, given the amount of economic activity and cross cultural connection and all that that we have. But that needs to be a conscious choice by the American people. And I don't think that is a conscious choice right, right now for Ukraine. And if they want it to be that way, well, you gotta sell it to us then. You right. gotta come out and say like, all right guys, we're signing up for a hundred year commitment here. Um, and that we're gonna, we're gonna turn Ukraine in the next South Korea. It's like, okay, well, are we all ready for, you know, a billion or no, a trillion dollars or so to be spent in terms of economic development there? That seems like a big, big lift and not something necessarily that has a democratic support. Right. So they have to they have to sell it to us first. Right. None of these wars were like declared and voted on. Right. right. Bingo.
Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.